Hi, welcome to Cafe Two Two Nine. Today, we're very happy and honored to have Dr. Nancy McWilliams. Dr. Nancy McWilliams, I would say she's probably one of the most important clinicians of our times, and we're really happy to have her. She is pretty much the face of psychoanalytic psychotherapy. Hi, Dr. McWilliams. Hi. Thank you so much for being with us. So, as an expert in the mental health field.、Um, Can you say a little bit? What are the vital signs of a good mental health? Like, how do we know we have good mental health other than just not being anxious? Well, thank you for asking me that question because it's something that I focused on for quite a long time. I got interested in the fact that the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of the American Psychiatric Association has no concept of mental health. They just have a list of mental disorders, and I started thinking about the tradition of thinking about mental health in、um, not just psychoanalytic circles, but other orientations towards psychotherapy. And I slowly put together a list of ten elements of overall mental health. They're the vital signs of improvement.、Uh, let me give you one example. I had a patient who came in and said, "The strangest thing happened to me on the way here." Now, this was a paranoid man. He looked a little troubled, but he he said, "I found myself thinking I'm going to feel better after I talk to Nancy about this, and I've never felt that way about anybody." This was after a couple of years of therapy, and I was very pleased because. For the first time, he had the concept that another person could be a source of comfort rather than a source of torment. He'd had a terrible history himself. After that session, he got more anxious and a little bit more paranoid for a while. So symptomatically,、uh, I think because he had shown me that vulnerability to a real attachment with me, he got temporarily worse. But In terms of his sense of increased safety in relationship, I felt that was a vital sign of his starting to get better.、Um, so the kinds of vital signs I'm talking about that are part of mental health are things like a sense of safety in relationship, or what the attachment theorist calls movement towards secure attachment. Another is a sense of continuity with the self. Some patients. Have no memory of childhood or no capacity to sort of imagine themselves in the future.、Um, uh, when they feel they behave badly, they feel all bad.、Um, sometimes they go into states of feeling all good. They don't have a continuity of the sense of the goodness and badness in their personality or the past, present, and future. So the second thing that I emphasize is a sense of personal continuity and. Going on being,、uh, as the the writer Winnicott described it.、Uh, the third thing I was a sense of agency. We try to increase in patients their capacity to see the areas in their life over which they have some influence or control. Resilience is another one. If you're stressed, can you come back from it,、uh, or are you devastated by it? Can you cope with it with、um, a mature way of coping, or do you go into primitive defenses like denial、um, to deal with it? Sure. Self-esteem <laughs> is your self-esteem realistic? In other words, are you able to、um, let yourself know when you've done well enough, or do you have really harsh perfectionistic notions for yourself, or? Inflated notions for yourself, like "Hey, everything I do is perfect because I did it." Either one of those is not realistic. Can you reflect on yourself, and can you imagine the separate subjectivities of other people?、Um, do you see that maybe you have a, an internal conflict? You want something and you don't want it.、Uh, for example, being really able to understand that other people have separate Minds in 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 a, I mean obviously everybody understands that at some level, 
But right. for example, I had a man not long ago who, who said to me about his nine month old baby, um, that kid really knows how to push my buttons. <laughs> uh, so it occurred to me, this guy didn't have a sense of a baby. He thought uh, the baby was trying to manipulate him. Right, right, right. Vitality is a big part of mental health. You know, you, you can be functioning, but not feel enthusiastic or um, curious or um, alive. So we try to increase that in our patients. We try to help them with the, the, the duality of, you know, some things require self-advocacy and some require sacrifice for the common good. Cultures differ on where they um, encourage us to be on that. People who test most positively um, on self-esteem uh, and other measures uh, of mental health are strong on both ends. You know, they can advocate for themselves as an individual when necessary, and they can surrender to um, the needs of, of others when that's called for. One other vital sign is, can you accept what can't be changed? A lot of psychotherapy is helping people grieve and recover from things that can't be changed. They, if they've been traumatized, they can never be a person who was not traumatized. They can be a much healthier trauma survivor. And ultimately, we're trying to help people love better, work better, and play better. <laughs> <laughs> that, what so, Freud said, right? That's my list. <laughs> sure, sure. No, no, that's a great, that's a great, wonderful list you provided us. But I think you start out by saying that our current mental health field often just have a list of labels on what's wrong with you, right? You're depressed, you're anxious, and as if, if we're healthy means just free from those lists. But then that's not really the same. Being healthy is not just being free from disorders is really having good able to create relationship with people yeah right have, have the ability to develop resiliency have vitality right it, yeah right i mean it's like the, the list that you have are very wonderful for us to reflect on how many well i don't want to make it become a checklist for ourselves but but these are the signs that we can pay attention to I would say. But I think one thing that you mentioned that's quite important, which is the first one to me actually, is sort of the ability to form relationship with others, right? I mean, that is quite crucial in yeah. living a good life is how to form relationship. And if, and if you are having no self-esteem, if you have no boundary, it, it's, it just makes things a lot harder. So from the psychoanalytic perspective, what are sort of one of the biggest obstacles um, or one of the biggest reasons why people are having difficulties living a good life or having good mental health? I mean, of course, there are many factors, but like what would be the one we should pay very much attention to? Well, I think you know, part of my shtick as a therapist is that it's very hard to generalize across individuals. Different individuals have different stories. I mean, some, some people have a difficult genetic inheritance, you know, maybe they're very highly sensitive from infancy on or very intense or very aggressive. So some, some people have a much harder time managing their temperament in relationships. Other people had, um, very bad early experiences. Um, parents who were abusive or negligent or completely inconsistent or turned the tables on the child trying to get the child to parent the adult, that can leave uh, terrible traces, but so does poverty. Um, trauma that can't be uh, prevented by caregivers. Um, illness, bullying is uh, a terribly destructive experience. You can have very loving parents. And if you're bullied, uh, I, let me just give you a, a, a sort of astonishing figure. 
We tend to think of psychotic disorders as having a strong biological component. And the research shows that it's true that there is some you know, genetic vulnerability to psychosis. But if you are raped, you're 18 times more likely to be diagnosed with schizophrenia than oh, someone wow. who was never okay. raped. Wow. So, so the so environment. Trauma and adverse childhood experiences turn out to be, you know, extremely damaging to overall mental health. Right. So some of us may not be as fortunate to have a, 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 a suffering free kind of lifestyle where we may get picked on, especially during right now, I mean, the internet era where there's a lot more trolling and a lot more bullying that's coming from everywhere. I mean, in the past, you just get bullied in the classroom. Now it's like you've got the right. internet. You right now you're over. shamed forever. Yeah, yeah. So, so, it, so, it's, so the reason why people may suffer come from not just genetics, but also environmental reason, bad experiences. And so, so it is an unfortunate sort of many different combination on why we would suffer. Now, so so I, I guess one thing, sometimes I speak to friends who are not familiar with psychotherapy and they're like, so what does psychotherapy really do? And then when they look up psychotherapy, there are so many different schools yeah. of psychotherapy. It's like, it's like, wait, like which one should I pick? It's almost like when I go into like HMAR, that I wanna buy a box of cereal, there's like 50 brand there. <laughs> It's hard to pick yeah. one. <laughs> so, so I guess uh, maybe you can speak a little bit about how is psychoanalytic approach different than other approach, but more important, importantly, what does psychotherapy do? Like what is the key ingredient that helps people? Well, you know, <laughs> we have a lot of data on different approaches to different symptomatic constellations because that research is is fairly easy to do. You know, you can isolate people who have one problem, like let's say um, an anxiety disorder and no other problem. Right. And you can measure it and you can do a particular set of interventions. And then you can measure whether the symptom got better or worse. That kind of research is much easier to do than um, long-term research on on, on real psychotherapy as it happens in the real world. Now, doing that research has created some very good interventions with many kinds of symptomatic problems. I don't wanna um, talk down other orientations because I think it's been very healthy overall for them to be, for there to be competing languages and ways of thinking about how to help people. Um, the psychoanalytic tr tradition is the oldest uh, mm -hmm. psychotherapeutic tradition. Sure. And I think it, it's not antithetical to other approaches. Many analytically oriented people that I know uh, incorporate into their work things like body work, um, uh, eye movement desensitization and reprocessing, um, certain kinds of attention to trauma, sure. uh, sometimes hypnosis. I mean, many people integrate various approaches to therapy, mm -hmm. but it's interesting what the overall research shows. The overall research shows that what matters are two factors. One is personality factors um, in both the therapist and the patient. And the other is relationship factors. Uh, there's a 2012 press release that the American Psychological Association uh, released that hasn't gotten that much uh, attention, but it basically uh, gives all the extensive empirical evidence for the fact that the relationship matters more than the brand name of the therapy. Um, these days, because cognitive behavioral treatments tend to be easier to research, and also people in the cognitive behavioral tradition have valued research much more than many people in the psychodynamic tradition did, 
um, it's, it's become common to say, well, cognitive behavioral therapy is the therapy of choice, but this, that, or the other thing. Sure. That's not what the data show overall. Um, the data show that all therapies are somewhat helpful. Um, some are a little bit more helpful than others for very particular kinds of conditions. But what really matters most is, do you feel comfortable with the therapist? Do you feel the therapist is interested in you, is respectful of you, is warm, is non-judgmental, and is genuinely trying to help you solve the problem? If you've got that, if you feel that in relationship, um, you can come at how to deal with your symptoms in a number of different ways. Um, and you'll get help. Yeah. No, I, I think that's a very important point because sometimes I get questioned like, I don't know my therapist is a good therapist or not a good therapist. And so would you say that one of the key things we should pay attention to when we're looking for a therapist is some kind of personality match? Should I say that? Yeah. Do you feel okay with this person? Do you feel this person is authentic with you? Um, do you feel that they're interested in you? Do you feel you could tell your darkest secrets to this person and recover from the shame of exposing all those things to the other person? Do you feel like they're accepting of you in all of who you are? Mm -hmm. That's much more important than what their training is. Yeah, yeah. So, so it's like for our future therapists, what, how do we train our future therapists? I know you just wrote a book on supervision. How do we train therapists in terms of forming good relationship with the clients, with the patients, instead of, I guess, worrying too much which right technique to do? I'm sure techniques are important, but like my experience with some of my supervisees in the past is they're very focused on what are the right technique to use and almost forgetting the relationship in the room as if. Yes, we've gone too much in that direction. <laughs> I, I blame the drug companies to some extent for this, because if you're a drug company, you know, you, you want to think about things in terms of very specific symptoms that you could influence, because then you can market your drug for that kind of symptom. And then we got interested in, well, can psychotherapy change those symptoms just as fast. And people um, like David Barlow conducted a lot of studies that show that usually they can. Um, so, you know, in some ways, we're, we're all reacting to the commercial um, culture in which we're all ensconced. But overall, that, that's not what people want when they go to therapy. They don't want to tinker with something and, and, and score a little bit better on the Beck Depression inventory than they did at the start, you know, eight sessions ago. They want to be understood. They want to grapple with something. They have a larger issue than just symptom reduction. They see that their relationships always follow a particular pattern. They want to break that pattern. Right. Um, so patients often are told now that you should get somebody who has this, 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 or this competency. And therapists, young therapists often feel as if they should have this incredibly rich toolbox of competencies for a particular symptomatic presentation. But that's not what the, what the empirical data show matters. I'm, I'm old fashioned in terms of how to train therapists. I think the best training for therapists is to get into therapy themselves with somebody they trust and work on themselves because nobody has perfect mental health. Everybody has something they can work on. Sure. Uh, everybody has areas of vulnerability. And you have to know what it's like to be in the patient's chair in order to fully um, accept your patients and make them feel like you, you get it. So there are many reasons why therapists should get their own therapy. Uh, yeah, I, I, I think that's, that's one of them. <laughs> that's that I think that's the same kind of recommendation I have with my supervisee as well is individual therapy is quite important. It's almost like if we're going to guide people to have some self understanding, you probably want to try it yourself before you start to do it with others. 
Um, but I think you mentioned a little bit on the, I guess the industrialization of mental health, right? If you have this problem, we use this technique. If you have that problem, we use that technique. And sometimes we even manualize the, the treatment process, which is, which I guess it become, I don't know, sometimes I feel like manualizing therapy is almost like a manualized dating book or something like if you date someone <laughs> first well, date you should do that is a research requirement for a particular kind of research right right if you're going to study a particular technique you have to make sure everybody's following the same pattern right but right. it's not a clinical requirement in fact patients really don't like it if they feel like you're following a cookbook <laughs> There was right. one empirical study that found that the more the therapist adhered to the manual, the less well their patients did. Because the that patients don't... felt they were being treated as objects, not as individual people that the therapist could be surprised by or interested in or adapt their technique to. Right, right. That makes sense. That makes sense. I remember I was talking to one of my like behavioral colleague and I like, I'm like, if you're going to go for therapy, do you go to another behavior? It's like, they're like, nah, <laughs> I would go to, <laughs> I would go to a more traditional insight oriented kind of uh, therapy. So now I, I know psychoanalytic approach are often called an insight oriented approach. Like what mm -hmm. kind of insight do people get from working with another person closely? Like why is it called an insight approach? Well, how, how would you describe that? That's, a, that's an interesting question because Sigmund Freud never used the term insight. I'm not sure how that came to be thought of as the um, be all and end all of psychoanalytic therapy. But, but that does tend to be what you talk about. Uh, a lot of what happens in psychotherapy is um, more experiential. In other words, if you had a critical parent, what's really healing to you is to be uh, in the presence for months or years of somebody who doesn't criticize you. And that's a silent thing that's going on. It's not like you, you, you have to have blinding insight about that, but what you talk about during the period that you're slowly internalizing that there's a different way to be in relationship. You don't have to feel constantly worried that you're going to be criticized. What you talk about is you try to understand your own tendency to expect constant criticism. So that's the insight part of it. Uh, actually, there's research on insight that shows that very often insight is more of a product of psychotherapy than the method of <laughs> right. attaining therapeutic gains. Uh -huh. Makes sense. Makes sense. So, so the insight is really sort of the, this awareness this re-experiencing of something uh, that you did not experience before, like to know something that you don't know or to, yeah. right, to become in touch with the feelings and ideas that you were not in touch with. So that's, and, and that, I, I guess they call it a corrective experience or a corrective emotions. Yes, I mean, there is an emotionally corrective experience in a good, psychotherapy. And there usually is also insight. I think Peter Fonagy's concept of reflective function that I talked about is self-reflection is, is part of mental health. There's a big difference between um, a patient who, who says, um, you know, uh, uh, I love men and treats them badly. Um, and a patient who says, I want to like men and I think I do, but there's a part of me that also hates them. And I think it comes from my father. Um, that's a reflective person. And we want to move the first patient more into the capacity that the second person already has. I, I found uh, that I think right now there are certain fields within psychology, such as positive psychology, are started advocating more on the strength of our mind instead of just focusing on the weakness such as problems just not not like dsm but more like let's just focus on more on what we can build on so i i found yeah. like what you're saying is sort of along the similar line as the positive 
psychology field? Well, I think psychotherapists have always trying to build on a patient's strengths. Um, it's a misunderstanding of us that we pathologize everybody. We really don't, you know, besides most of us in the psychoanalytic field, we've all had our own therapy. So we've been there and, you know, we're not in the position to try to see everybody else as having this awful disease that we couldn't possibly find in ourselves. I think that the positive psychology movement to some extent uh, created a straw person out of uh, psychotherapists thinking that, they, that we're all pathologizing people all right. the time. Right. On the other hand, they have, they have made some nice discoveries. You know, I'm a little critical of them because I think they've emphasized happiness more than most therapists would. You know, the, the pursuit of happiness doesn't tend to make you particularly happy in the long run. Uh, living up to reasonable standards tends to, I mean, their own research tends to find this. But I think a, a therapist would say that part of mental health is being able to tolerate normal suffering. Yeah. And not see all sadness as depression that should be medicated because sadness is a part of life. Pain is a part of life. Humility is a part of life. You know, things like uh, even ordinary shame has a positive aspect. It, it helps you, you know, do better. Right. So the negative feelings are not necessarily always a curse. And, and feeling happy all the time is not a reasonable expectation. But having said that, I'll say that, yeah, the positive psychology movement has put um, an emphasis on resilience, uh, on phenomena like gratitude, um, like forgiveness, right, uh, right. Some, of the, some of the virtues that I would say come naturally out of a good psychotherapy experience. If you help people accept what can't be changed, they move toward gratitude for what is and forgiveness for things that have hurt them and people who've hurt them. Uh, so I, I see those, those things as the consequences of a good psychotherapy. But um, yeah, I, I think positive psychology is, is not at all in conflict with the way most psychoanalytic therapists think. And that, I guess they go hand in hand, right? You need to have good mental health in order to cultivate virtue and virtue could also help you to cultivate good mental health. So I think they could go hand in hand with each other. So yeah, they could be a virtuous <laughs> cycle and often they are. Yeah. Yeah. So thank you so much for coming to our cafe two to nine. And I know you're a busy clinician. What are the last few words you have for our audience? What do you think is one good take home message that our audience should remember from your wisdom. <laughs> if you are looking for a therapist, treat yourself like a valued evaluator and trust your own intuition about where you feel you could open up and get help. If you're suffering from mental health problems, you've probably lost some trust in your own judgment and your own natural intuition. But our brains are social and perceive a lot about others and let us know when we are safe and likely to flourish and find that response in yourself and follow it. Great. Thank you so much. I'm having a, such a wonderful time with you. This is uh, <laughs> such a wonderful learning lesson for me and hopefully for our audience. So thank, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Lin. <laughs> very kind of you. And thank you for watching Cafe to Tonight every month, third Friday, 7 p.m. Stay tuned.